When I was a little child, I used to read Bible story books over and over again. Uh, they captured my imagination. I learned about the Old Testament heroes of the faith, the obedience of Noah building an ark despite opposition from scoffers, the faith of Abraham, as we heard a few weeks ago, leaving everything behind to follow God to an unknown land, the obedience of Isaac, not a child, by the way, a little child, when he allowed his father to tie him up as a sacrifice. He was a little bit older, actually. Jacob's dream, do you remember that? The ladder to heaven with angels ascending and descending. Joseph's faithful perseverance leading him to be second in command in Egypt, prime minister. David defying Goliath and taking out this enemy of God and God's people with just one small smooth stone from his sling. Samson, defeating a horde of Philistines with just a donkey jawbone. But here's the problem. None of my Bible story books that I read as a child exposed any, any major failures of my Bible heroes, like Noah's drunkenness. Or Abraham's deception, as you'll be hearing later today, jeopardizing his wife's purity and God's promised blessing. And then, not only that, but Isaac's further deceit. Now, I did learn about, in my Bible story books, about Jacob's deceit of his father, but for some reason I thought that was pretty amazing of how he got that fur and put it on his arms and made him smell like his brother. And I believe somehow that Esau was getting what was coming to him. Joseph's prideful boasting never hit the pages of, of my storybooks. Samuel's continual lust and dishonesty didn't either. And certainly, David committing adultery and murder never, ever came up. So, when I hit my teenage years and I failed, guess what? I wallowed in shame. Every time I sinned, I would look at myself in the mirror and I would ask, what is wrong with you? Are you even saved? I'd say to myself, faithful followers of Jesus never fail. They don't sin like you. And it was this vicious cycle. I would pull up my socks. I would try harder to read my Bible. And I would volunteer for more ministries, hoping to, even though I had made a decision for Christ when I was younger, hoping to somehow earn God's favor, missing the glory of God's grace through Jesus. Now, when I started reading my Bible from cover to cover when I was a young adult, something changed. I realized that the characters in the Bible struggled with temptation and sin like I do. And even the most faithful followers had moments in their lives that they undoubtedly wished weren't written down. Even Jesus' greatest missionary, the Apostle Paul, confessed, For I do not the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. And as I read the entire stories, of God's people of faith, I began to realize something. The people of these stories weren't the heroes. God is. God is the hero of every one of these true Bible stories. And God, who revealed himself in Jesus Christ, he is a God of compassion on his children. Those who have placed their faith and trust in him. I began to realize that God has more compassion on me as his child than I do for myself. And that his love, as we sang about this morning, embraces his children. That even though he hates our sin that causes us to stumble and to fall, that he continually loves his children. Do you know, when we cry out to him and 
confession and repentance, he is quick to forgive. He takes our hand and he lifts us up when our face is fallen flat in the mud. Not grudgingly, but with compassion and tender mercies, he puts our feet back on solid ground. And when we face the consequences of our sin, he continues to keep his promises. And if we let him, he uses our sinful failures to teach us faith and dependence upon him. That is the God that we serve. It's the God that David sang about when he wrote in Psalm 32, I acknowledge my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Now, two weeks ago, Pastor Isaac, he was adorned, by the way, in a beautiful Father's Day tie. You have to take a look at it after the service. Hand-stitched, right, Pastor Isaac? It says Dad on it. Introduced us to Abraham. Abram, actually, later known as Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, a man of faith who left everything behind. Having heard from God, he denied his culture. He abandoned his lifelong home. He disconnected with his extended family, sacrificed his real estate, threw away any legacy that he had hoped for in his cultured city of Ur. And then Abraham built altars at Shechem, and where and another place which would later become Jerusalem in the promised land, announcing to the local residents that the God of Abram has come to Canaan. And these monuments symbolized Abraham's faithfulness. As Charles Swindle points out, Abraham was stating, Lord, I trust in you and I believe in you. I rely on you. I need you. I'm your servant Help me along this journey of faith so I may walk with confidence and receive the promises of your covenant. But the story doesn't end there. The journey of faith is never without failures. Obedience, you see, came gradually for Abram and his wife Sarai. And in today's true story from the life of Abraham, we learn that sometimes the faithful fail. And God has lessons for us in these stories in the Bible as well. Well, before we look at today's true story and what God wants to teach us from his word, let's pause and let's ask for God's help. Father in heaven, we confess to you on this Father's Day that all of us, fathers included, are imperfect, weak human beings. We are subject to taking our eyes off of you and going down our own paths. And thank you that in your mercy and in your kindness that you will never abandon those who have pledged allegiance to you in faith, your children saved by your grace. And help us this morning learn about you, the hero in this story. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Take your Bibles with me and turn to Genesis chapter 12. Again, we're going to carry on where we left off last time. Genesis chapter 12, verses 10 through 20. If those of you who are new to our church, you can grab one of the blue Bibles in front of you. And Genesis chapter 12, uh, Genesis, the first book of the Bible, so you find it pretty easily. Listen in as I read this. True story of what happened next. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. And he was about to enter Egypt. He said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. 
When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. And then they will kill me, but will let you live. Say, you're my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake, and Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me, he said. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. And then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. Now this is a story of failure Failure that almost led to disaster. It was caused by panic and a desire to save their own skin. By the way, Abram isn't alone in this. Sarai was a willing participant. We know that because later on in Genesis chapter 20, verse 13, Abraham confessed, And when God had me wander from my father's household, I said to her, meaning his wife, this is how you can show your love to me. Everywhere we go, say of me, he is my brother. Now here's the question. Why is this story in the Bible? Why does God include stories in the Bible about the imperfections of the good and the godly? The strong becoming weak. The faithful failing. Well, the New Testament, by the way, gives us a clue. You see, these are true stories for Jesus' followers to learn from. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6 says this. Now these things occurred, they're true stories, as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. A few verses later, the Bible says this. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the age has come. So why is this story of Abram deliberately deceiving Pharaoh about his wife, Sarai, included in the Bible? Well, it's to teach us about God and about ourselves. And here's the first thing that God teaches us. God allows tests in our lives to reveal the true depth of our faith. You see, Abram, as we learned earlier, passed the first test with flying colors. Saw that in Pastor Isaac's message. But after he had erected his second altar, Abram faced his first challenge. Genesis 12.10 says that there was a famine that struck. And the word literally there means hunger, hunger. Now, famine often hit this part of the land, as we learn later on with the story of Joseph. But you see, Abram was new to the land. He was new to the land. He came from the Fertile Crescent. And so being faced with hunger was a major test. And God was saying to Abram, yes, I've seen the altars that you have erected in my name. But let me reveal to you how deep your faith really is. How much do you truly depend on me, Abram, to meet your needs? How much do you believe that I will keep my promise of providing an offspring that will eventually bless the whole earth? And by the way, can I just add this? God doesn't allow tests in our lives so that he can just watch us and see how we respond. Because remember, God is sovereign. He is all-knowing. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows us better than we know ourselves. So why does he allow us to face these tests? Well, it's to reveal us to ourselves. He wants us to learn where we need to grow. And you know it like I do. After I've failed in my life, 
The tests that I've failed, it often leads to times of growth. You see, the test that God allows in our lives, and we see this all the way throughout Scripture, reveal something about our hearts, our default response to crisis. You know, when our faith is severely challenged, we have this default setting that we revert to, don't we? It's it's like a a self-preservation reflex. And soon it becomes not just a reflex, but it becomes a full-scale coping mechanism. It takes over. It keeps us from trusting in God. Now look how this played out in Abram's life. For him, that coping mechanism was deception. It was lying. Now he didn't cheat in his everyday life and his everyday business practices. When did he deceive? When did he lie? When it meant saving his own skin. He had become an expert in this. We know that this was a default setting in his life because he returned to this default setting at least one more time in his life that we learn about in chapter 20. But you know, there was a first, more subtle test that he faced at the outset. Right when he initially faced the famine, did you catch it? He rushed down to Egypt instead of seeking God's counsel. Before, he had built altars. Talking to God, being in communion with God, but there's no evidence that he did that this time. And so the famine strikes and there's no more prayers. There's no more altars. And interestingly enough, after this event in the Bible... Egypt becomes a literary symbol. F.B. Meyer explains. Let me read this to you. In the figurative language of Scripture, Egypt stands for an alliance with the world. Abram acted simply on his own judgment. He looked at his difficulties and he became paralyzed with fear. He grasped at the first means of deliverance that suggested itself, much as a drowning man will catch at straw. And thus, without taking counsel of his heavenly protector, Abraham went down into Egypt. And Meyer concludes, ah, fatal mistake. But how many make it still? They may be true children of God, and yet in a moment of panic, they will adopt methods of delivering themselves that, to say the least, are questionable, showing the seeds of sorrow and disaster to save themselves from some minor embarrassment. Now, later in the history of Israel, Isaiah the prophet used Egypt as a symbol demonstrating Israel's faithless response to an invasion. Listen to this, Isaiah 31 verse 1. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, who rely on horses, who trust in the multitude of their chariots and in the great strength of their horsemen, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel or seek help from the Lord. Here's what God was trying to teach Abram. A test that he finally passed, by the way, later on in his life, a story that we will look at a little bit later in June. God was teaching this principle that's found in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Some of you have memorized this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Let me ask you a tough question. When you face crisis, whether it is a threat to your safety or security, whether it's your health, whether it's your reputation, how do you respond? Does fear drop you to your knees? Or do you face sleepless nights trying to figure out things on your own? One morning when I was working on this message, this was in my devotional reading. When I'm afraid... I put my trust in you, in God, whose word I praise. In God I trust and am not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? 
And our Lord Jesus taught something similar in Luke chapter 12. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. What does Jesus say that we have to do instead? Instead, he says we have to fear or have an awe-filled respect for God, who is the ultimate judge. And when our gaze is on our heavenly Father and his Son Jesus through his Holy Spirit, when our trust is in his sovereign care, our default setting changes. We go to our triune God first. The one who has saved us eternally through the sacrifice of Jesus, our Messiah, on the cross. Now here's the second thing that God teaches us through this dramatic story of Abram. This is so important. God will intervene in our failures because of his faithfulness and not ours. You see, Abraham's scheme did not come from faith. He wanted Sarai to deceive the Egyptians into thinking that he was, she was not his wife, but his sister, probably to buy time to escape. In that era, anyone wanting to marry a sister of a Bedouin background would have to make negotiations. And the deception was a subtle thing, for she was already his half-sister. Abram was satisfying his own conscience, knowing that she was technically his sister, but he also knew how the Egyptians would understand it. His motivation is found in verse 13. Say that you are my sister. Why? So I will be treated well for your sake, and my life may be spared because of you. Now, Abraham, or Abram, had no idea that this scheme of his, this deceit, would jeopardize his wife's purity and safety, and beyond that, jeopardizing the promised blessing. The blessing that God had promised Abram and Sarai that they would start a new nation. And from that nation, the Savior of the world would be born. You know, Satan was probably laughing. He was probably laughing when he saw what was happening. And all throughout scriptures, you see Satan's schemes of trying to derail God's plan of salvation for humankind. The wording of the last part of verse 15 is simple and powerful. It simply says, and she was taken into his, Pharaoh's, palace. The entire scheme of deceit unravels In an instant. As scholar Alan Ross says, Sarai is both silent and passive. The text offers no details or explanation, and Abram is powerless to prevent the seizure. His scheme might have worked with those who would negotiate for Sarai, but here was one who had no need to negotiate. Humanly, the situation seemed hopeless. Now, I feel like I can identify with Abram's panic just a little bit. This Thursday, my wife Wendy and I will have been married 27 years. And I remember, by the way, we're just as much in love today as we were 30 years ago. But I remember one time when Wendy and I were courting, you know what it's like when teenagers are in love or young adults are in love? We were courting, we went to a a city park far from home, it was the next town uh, after a Sunday night service and it was a beautiful park, it had a lookout over the entire city of London, you could just see all these trees and and, uh, we were so enamored with this lookout over the city and the sunset, beautiful sunset, and each other, um, (laughs) that we had no clue at all that the giant wrought iron gates of this park had been closed, padlocked, and locked shut with chains. I came running out and looking at the chains, and they were locked for the night. 
And I knew I was in trouble because I had to get her back by a certain time. <laughs> it was too late. So I backed my car down the hill and I took a run at the, there was two big giant hills on either side of the gate and I tried run, uh, going up the grassy hill and the car wheels just got stuck in the mud. So I backed it down and I'll tell you, I didn't pray. I panicked. And a greasy, long-haired teenager knocked at my window. And he grinned. Let me take a shot at it. And to Wendy's horror, I quickly jumped out of the car and gave him the wheel to my car. <laughs> and he floored the gas pedal of my 5.7 liter engine and disappeared with Wendy rocketing over the top of the hill and I thought, how could I have been so stupid? <laughs> I gave both my girl and my car to this goon. <laughs> so I was just, my heart was just pounding. I just raced up to the top of the hill and I saw, I looked down onto the road below and I saw the car neatly parked on the shoulder of the road below me with Wendy unharmed and the car still intact. I was so thankful. And I'll tell you, I didn't deserve that. And neither did Abram deserve what he got next. God's mercy and grace. Listen to this. Abram's wealth grew exponentially. Abram acquired sheep and cattle, verse 16. Male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. And not only that, Pharaoh got the short end of the stick. Verse 17, but the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. Sarai remains untouched. That should have given Pharaoh a clue. She was the only one unscathed. And he must have assumed somehow that he offended Abram's God. And we're not sure how Pharaoh found out that Sarai was Abram's wife. I remember one Sunday school teacher <laughs> saying that he looked out the window and he saw Abram and his wife kissing. We don't know. <laughs> but he did somehow. And Abram, who is God's child, was rebuked by a pagan. What have you done to me, verse 18? Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. And then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men, and they had him sent on his way with his wife and everything he had. God intervened, despite Abram's foolishness. Now let's be clear. There were times in the experience of the nation of Israel that God didn't deliver his people from their predicaments. God may at sometimes deliver his people, and sometimes he may not. That's not the point of the story. The point is, is that his word, his promise was at stake. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 22, God's people were reminded of the divine motivation for the restoration of his people. Listen to this. This is what the sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I'm going to do these things. But for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. God's saying, I do this for the sake of my glory. In our story, God had promised that through Abram, all nations of the world would be blessed. We know that to be the promise of Messiah revealed in Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah. He would be a descendant of Abram. And if Abram's wife was gone, the child of promise, making way for the Messiah, would never be born. You see, when God intervenes in our failures, it's because of his faithfulness, his mercy, his grace. It's nothing we deserve. Now, some may say, and they may ask the question, but why did God bless Abram with possessions? 
It says that he got to take all these things with him. I'm going to ask you a question. Were they totally blessings? The ill-gotten gain plagued him with problems for years to come. First, with the strife of Lot's herdsmen that you read right, right about in the very next chapter. And then a little later, tension over one of those maidservants that Pharaoh gave him. Do you remember her name? Her name is Hagar. And even though God graciously protected his plan of salvation through divine intervention when his servant complicated it with deception, there was still a cost. There was still a lesson. You see, it's foolish to try to deliver ourselves from threatening situations using deceptive schemes. So when God intervenes in our failures, it's all about him. He's the hero. We don't deserve it. In this case, God wasn't allowing anybody or anyone to interfere with his plan of salvation, his plan of redemption. And you know, it's the same in our lives. If we truly know and love the Lord Jesus, God will never lose his grip on us. We may fail, we may fall into sin, but if we're truly his, Jesus makes this promise. John 10, 27 to 29, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. Abram had been tested. And God revealed to him the true nature of his faith. It was still weak. And yet God made it so clear to Abram and to Sarai that he wasn't finished with them yet. Their journey was not complete. Which brings me to the last lesson. God desires for us to grow more like Christ, learning from our failures. You know, it's so common, as I shared at the beginning, for us to wallow in shame and self-pity after we failed. But you know, that's Satan's desire for us. That's his plan for us, not God's. He desires for us to learn from our failure and to grow, not to wallow. Every one of us faces famines, crises. A doctor's report with bad news. Conflict in marriage, death of a loved one, unemployment, financial crisis, you name it. And these can make us fear. But they can also, if we let them, take us into a deeper relationship with Jesus. Dependent upon him for his wisdom and strength that only Jesus can provide through his Holy Spirit in our lives. And you know, when we fail... God teaches us things. He shows us things. He did in Abram's life. What things did he teach Abram? What does he teach us? First of all, when we fail, he teaches us that we've been believing a lie. The lie that says, I can handle this without God. Our default setting is often believing that with enough ingenuity or, or guts or even deception, we can survive the famine. We can escape pain on our own. And God uses failure in our lives to teach us that that's a lie. Secondly, God teaches us how our sins always hurt people. It hurts ourselves and often those closest to us. Those who trust us, they get hurt too. One pastor says this, every compromise jeopardizes a Sarai. There is no such thing as a victimless sin, including the sins you keep private. You may sin in secret, but you never sin alone. Thirdly, God also teaches us how weak we really are, how much we need Jesus. Abram fell after building not one, but two altars. 
and God showed him how vulnerable he really was. More religion isn't the answer. Spending more time reading the Bible is good. But even that's not the answer. Attending church is important. But even that doesn't answer all the questions. We are all weak and vulnerable. We all need supernatural help, the help of his Holy Spirit that does come when we let him as we read his word and as we fellowship together with other believers. Here's what I'd like you to do this week in your quiet time. Take your journal or notebook and ask this question. What sinful failures has God rescued me from? List them. And after a time of prayer, asking for God's help, write down the top two or three things that God has been trying to teach you through each one. It's an amazing exercise. And then if you get the courage after you've done that, I trust that you do, take it and share with someone that you really trust and pray together that God will complete the work that he has started in your life. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, this morning we want to say thank you for never giving up on us, your children. And Lord, I just pray that there's anyone here that is not yet your child, who hasn't been forgiven through faith in the Lord Jesus, help them take that initial step For those of us who are your children, help us rejoice in your mercy and in your grace. Thank you for revealing yourself to us. And help us learn and grow. Even when we stumble and fall into sin, may we listen keenly for your voice. Help us respond to you. These things we pray in Jesus' powerful and precious name. Amen.